Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to this Lightband webinar for May 9th, 2019, titled Designing Events First Microservices for a Cloud Native World. My name is Oliver White, Chief Storyteller and MC at Lightband, and joining me today is someone who probably needs little introduction, but let's do it anyway. Jonas Bonaire is our speaker today. He is the creator of Akka, the co-founder and CTO of Lightband, a very frequent conference keynoter, an O'Reilly author, and also an avid skier who used to snowboard and is now back into skiing. While I introduce today's presentation, which should last almost an hour, perhaps a little bit, uh, little bit less, and we let any latecomers get settled in, I would like to ask our live audience a quick poll question. It's gonna pop up on your screen. We'll leave it up there for a minute. What is the biggest technical challenge you're facing today? So if you're joining us today, you're probably here to listen to a talk about event-driven microservices, and you're, you're about halfway right. We're actually here to talk about systems of microservices, because at an individual level, a single microservice doesn't really do all that much for us. It's only when our microservices start interacting with each other, similar to how we as humans, as well as some of the more intelligent animals out there communicate every day, that things get really interesting. And just like in real life, we still face challenges in ensuring that messages are received, understood, and so on. So when microservices start collaborating, we get to this very difficult and messy area of what's happening in the space between these services, meaning we need ways to coordinate events and commands across a distributed system using a cloud-centric network that is inherently unreliable. And this is why it's so great to have the father of Akka and distributed systems expert Jonas with us today. He'll start by going over a solid theoretical understanding of how to design systems of event-driven microservices. Then we'll cover some of the practical tools and techniques you can use to reap the most benefit from that design, as well as most importantly, what to avoid along the way. And finally, we'll review how an events-first design approach to building microservices can increase certainty, resilience, scalability, traceability, and more, all while reducing risk compared to other techniques. And if you are skeptical about microservices and cloud native at this point, it is okay. Jonas likes skeptics. And by the end of this talk, perhaps some of your ideals, ideas may be amenable to change. All right, thanks for voting in our poll. Just one more bit of housekeeping. As always, today's webinar is made possible only by people like you encouraging your company to become one of Lightbend's hundreds of happy customers, like one of our largest clients, Capital One. They are using the entirety of the Lightbend platform stack. They're looking for multiple positions, including uh, DevOps, as well as backend engineers with experience in Scala, Akka, Spark, Kafka, Kubernetes, and so on looking at those positions in San Francisco. You can find out more about this position and other open positions with awesome Lightbend customers on lightbend.com under the About tab. As always, also, today's webinar is being recorded, so it will be shared with you next week. And if you have any questions, we may have a couple minutes to get around to that at the end, so you can go ahead and pop those into the GoToWebinar control panel. Also, as you know, if you are an existing subscriber, you know that you can get into our customer portal where you can access all of our expert engineers when you have additional tech questions, what ifs, how to's and best practices, including and not limited to the things we cover today in this session. All right, time for me to shut up and let's hand it over to Jonas Bonaire. Jonas, so great to have you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot, Oliver. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I don't know how many times I've done these, these, these live and web, web, webinars, but it's always fun. Yeah, for me too. So let's get started. Uh, you're here to hear about events first mic microservices, and uh, there's really no time to lose here. Let's see, I just need to, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I suppose you, you have some idea that you either want to do microservices or, or are already doing microservices. I just want to start with, with, with saying that I hope, for, I hope this for if you are embarking on microservices for the right reasons. Uh, and, and not because it's hyped or cool or buzzworthy or and all those all those type of things, you know. There usually is hyped and buzzword for a reason, you know, that people find it successful and 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 and, and useful. But in my opinion, the right reasons to use microservices is, is is if you have a need for first scaling the organization, meaning being being sort of having being having the ability to 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 sort of split up 
uh, your organization into multiple independent autonomous teams that can sort of build services uh, in in isolation, deploy them independently, etc. And 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 uh, simply to 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 have a better chance of getting getting your service so get, get, so getting your feature out there faster. You know, time to market is everything. Uh, if not, you know, it actually might be that you are better off with the monolith. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there there are definitely cases where 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 microservices is is not needed, uh, uh, and and you know, people also talk about the distributed monolith as perhaps being an anti-pattern. But I have to say that in building distributed systems for all these years, you know, it's it's actually sometimes a good thing. To not split up your service, your your distributed system into fully independent in things built by independent teams. However, you know our our clients and, and me personally have have seen quite a lot of success through through applying the the, the microservices pattern and moving away from the monoliths. So and and and, the, and that's you know some of the experiences I will try to share today. So, but it's also, but it's very important to know what you're getting yourself into. You know, you know, by 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 embarking on microservices, you are also on a journey towards distributed systems. And you know, as soon as you, you, as we exit, you know, the the boundary of either a monolith, which is really a safe zone, uh, where you don't have to think about the, the distributed systems, or you exit the boundary of the individual service. We do enter this wild ocean of of non-determinism. You know that's the world of di of di distributed systems, and it's a, it's really a scary world if you look at it from from one perspective. You know it's it's a world where systems fail in the most spectacular ways. You know and and where information can, can get lost, and met your your messages or your requests can get lost, reordered, and get garbled on the way, etc. And and failure detection that you know the act of actually finding out of, of if, if who you're talking with is up or down or, or just out for lunch, you know, it's really a guessing game. So it, and this might sound ter terrifying, I'll try to illustrate that through this picture here, but it's also important to know that when that this, the world of distributed systems is really the world that also gives us solutions to things like resilience, elasticity, isolation, and a ton of other things. The one problem, you know, is that a lot of people they they sort of bring along a lot of a lot of habits that and patterns and techniques that used to work quite well when you when you were building the monolith, uh, and uh, sort of end up with with a hybrid approach that I I, I sometimes call microliths, and in and and microliths. You know, there's a lot to it, right? But, but try to simplify what I mean by that is that one of the things that, that you normally see here is that method calls are replaced by, by synchronous RPC calls across the network, but still blocking. And, and you're still using CRUD also in a blocking way. And the, the problem with this is that you, know, so you, you bring along all the problems with, with, with temporal coupling from the monolith uh, into distributed systems and by in, in, into a distributed system, and by doing that, you sort of increase the uh, uh, you know it's their problems as well. You know, you actually limits you know quite drastically the the way you, you can scale the system, the, the sort of the level of availability in the system, the extensibility of the system, the maintainability of the system, and things like that. And you know, distributed systems are really hard, but the only way to really tackle them is to go. Just sort of enter that world head on, you know, go all in on distributed systems and not trying to sort of pretend that we're still working in the safe zone of the monolith where everything is running on a single machine because we're not. So we can really do better than this, I, I, I believe. And, and one way of all doing that that I've seen great success with is to start thinking in events. And that might feel alien to a lot of people, but uh, or and some people, you know, if you if, if you've done a lot of you know swing development or UI work and stuff, then you are, then it might be quite natural to think in terms of, of events. But I believe that events can really help us uh, along the way of building really really good, uh, uh, really sort of solid, architecturally sound di distributed systems. 
and and you know the domain driven design community has 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 been has has been starting to sort of uh, uh, embrace uh, events or an events first perspective where you look at the world in the all the way all the way from design you know starting by thinking what happens in the system so through the lens of 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 of, of events and, but you know historically ddd domain driven design has been really a really good tool in order to, I mean, to help us build and design and understand complex systems you know it, it has a, a huge heritage i believe from orbit pro, pro, pro programming and that's also one of its you know drawbacks i believe because it's if if you just you know tackle it head on as as uh, uh, you know without uh, you know you know trying to put it in 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 the you know in in the world of today I think I mean sort of just applying you know the, the the principles that Eric Evans stated about 15 16 years ago now you end up with with usually with a focus on on the domain objects you know and and by focusing initially on the on the objects right at the at the start of the design. I believe that we we end up with the with the problem of focusing on structure too early in the design process, and 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 that's where events come in. You know, Greg Young said in one of the talks I I, I watched a few a couple of years ago that a, a really good thing that and then I quote: When you start modeling events, it forces you to think about the behavior of the system as opposed to thinking about the structure of the system. And when you think of it, you know. The behavior of the system is really what matters most. That's the business logic. That's the value that we can derive from 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 the system. So, in a modern way of looking at domain-driven design, you know, you should focus. You should not focus on the things. You know, we've been told to 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 to, to go out and find all the nuns. You know, trying to search the domain objects, trying to look look for structure. You know, that's the way I was taught of object-oriented design. Uh, you know, back in school. But instead, we should we should really try to understand what happens in the system. Focus on the verbs, because the verbs, you know, that gives us an, an, um, sort of a glimpse of the events and the events that matter in the system. But let's start with the basics. So, but what is an event? Um, so the nature of events is that events are are uh, rep sort of represent facts of the inf of information. And as we all know, facts are immutable. If something's done, it's done. You know, you, you can't take that back. And, and 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 you know, that's how we learn about systems. We learn about facts, and 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 we do that by sort of growing knowledge. So facts sort of accrue. You add more knowledge by adding more facts to existing facts. Okay. And 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 sometimes you know you it, 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 that might mean that you have to sort of invalidate existing knowledge, you know? And, uh, but, but it's also important that, that facts can be disregarded. It's okay to ignore facts. You can choose to accept what someone is telling you or disregard that because it might not be, uh, be sort of matching up with what you, I mean, with your, current, with, with your existing model of the world or whatever, you know? Facts, but, but, but in, in the pure model, I believe that you know, facts can't be retracted once they have accepted, but once they have been accepted. And also facts can't be deleted. You can't sort of erase information. You know, you, you can only sort of invalidate existing facts by adding new facts, okay? But of course, you know, for practical reasons, we have software engineers sometimes have to delete facts, you know, GRG, uh, GDPR, for example, you know, for legal or more, 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 more reasons or things like that but in the in the in the but in the in the pure model i believe that facts can only be be sort of invalidated by the arrival of new facts so through the way of you know knowledge is growing so in the design process we, we should sort of start by asking ourselves what are the facts you know to remind them just like like a detective and and a really good way of doing that is is a sort of a, an an increasingly popular approach called event storming. And event storming, you know, that I can that sort of deserves almost its own its own presentation. And there are a couple of really good books I know about, probably more nowadays, uh, on event storming. And you can probably find a lot of the material online as well. 
but it's essentially is that you that you you bring in all the stakeholders, all the domain experts, all the programmers, as they're sort of together into a single room, and you start brainstorming, you know, using post-it notes. And 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 the and what you try to do is you're trying to find the domain language through events, trying to understand how data flows, who's talking to who, understanding causality, you know, how facts are causally related, what is causing what, and things like that. Because that's really the path to understanding the system and understanding the business logic. And and, the, and we all know that the business logic is really where the where the beef is. You know, that's what really matters. Not essentially, not really what you I mean, sort of the, the structure of who's talking to who, but really the flow of information, the data. Okay. So <clears throat> in this design process that we then call event storming, we are really trying to do two things. First, we, we're, we're, we're trying to understand the intents. And you know, hints for intent can be things like communication, conversations, expectations, contracts of some sort. Or transfer of control when one party transfers, uh, you know, sort of the who's in charge over to someone else. And the second thing we're trying to understand is the facts. And, and hints for facts are things like state, history, causality, who's talking to who, in what order, things like notifications, things like state transfer. Instead of the transfer of control, we talk about the transfer of state. And you know, sort of modeling that to our world of, of software, intents are usually represented as commands, while facts are represented as events. Okay. I hope you all nod now. I can't really see you guys, but I hope I make sense here. So let's 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 try to dive in to commands and events a little bit more. Okay. Commands, they're really the object form. Of, of a method or an action request. And they're always phrased in the imperative, meaning things like create order, ship product, etc. And commands, they trigger reactions in, in the receiving side. Okay? And reactions usually represent some sort of side effect. You want to do something based on that command. Or you can choose to ignore it, of course, if you don't want to want to deal with that command at this point or ever. That's fine. You know, but if you choose to do something, it's called a reaction. Uh, and, and, and finally, you know, out of that reaction, you create an event. An event represents something that has already happened. You, know, you can't take that back. You did something by receiving the command as, as a way of, of, of encoding that in your system. You create an event. And the, an event is, is, that is there for always sort of always uh, uh, named in past tense, like order created, like order has been created, or product shift, product has been shipped. okay? But let's dig a little bit deeper. I promise you I'm, I'm done soon with this, with this part. Uh, commands are really all about intent, while events are, are pure intentless. Commands are directed, you know, they have a, a directed destination. You know, while, while events are anonymous, okay? Commands, they have a really, they have a single addressable de destination. You have some sort of reason to sending that command to, a specific, to that specific uh, receiver, to that, that specific party. While events, they just happens for anyone to observe. Can be zero, can be two, 500, can be a million, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. The one emitting the event doesn't care. He emits an event, whoever's, whoever's interested, yeah, deal with it if you're interested. Command models personal communication. You know, I'm, I'm talking to you guys, you know, one, uh, one by one. While events, you know, more broadcast, more of the model here, you know, I'm just, I'm just talking out, hopefully someone, someone is listening and, 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 and gets, you know, this, this, this information. And find it useful. Commands, you know, they have a distributed focus simply because they cross address spaces. You know, you're sending something from your context, from your address space to someone else. It can be across a network, can be across threads, can be across processes, but it has a distributed focus. While events, it has a local focus. You're just emitting events locally. It is, you know, a lot of systems have a way of relaying events. 
over or, across the network where they serve our, 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 our broadcast in there, you know, but, but the pure model of events, I believe, has a local focus. Commands, you know, they're really about command and control. I, I, I tell you to do something. Well, events are all about autonomy. And I'm, you know, no one is dictating anyone to do anything. I just, I, I, something happened. I tell the world about it. Act if you like to do so, or ignore if you like, you know. So, so, the, so I think the events are really a path towards building more autonomous systems. While you, of course, need commands as well. Sometimes that's the initiator of a, of a, of a workflow or the initiator of a request chain. Often commands are initiated by the client. And you know, to the first service that receives it, and then after that, you start triggering events depending on what, what what's happening. Okay, so we should really let the events define our boundary context. You know, let our sort of define our protocols based on what promises we can make and we can try to keep, and also what happens if we don't keep them. You know, and the nice thing with this is these are inverse the control flow. It puts the service in control. So in charge of his own destiny, instead of just being always being having to react to what is being told to do all the time. So what are the characteristics of an, of an event-driven service? Yeah, so first they receive and react or choose not to react to facts that, 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 that are coming its way. And, and as we talked about earlier, facts are these immutable events or represented as immutable. If you choose to accept one of these facts, you know, then it can then it can choose to sort of publish new facts as a result of, 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 of acting on the new information that, that came in. And it's very important that it publishes these facts in an ideal world, in an asynchronous fashion, in order just to minimize the coupling and to maintain the autonomy. But as soon as you start introducing things like blocking and synchronous communication, you reintroduce the blocking, or sorry, you reintroduce the coupling that we try to get rid of, you know, the coupling of the monitor. And, 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 you know, and, and what this does is that it inverts the, the, the control flow, as I've already mentioned, minimize the coupling and increase the autonomy. Uh, a lot of people ask me, I mean, you, afterwards, you know, after these type of discussions that if, I mean, what about mutable state? I mean, I mean people are usually used to think in terms of mutable state. Most languages, they encourage a, mute, a way of working with state that is in a, in, in a mutable way. And, you know, it has a lot of problems, of course, uh, when it comes to, con con to concurrency, to di distributed systems, and things like that. But I believe that, that using mutable state can be totally fine. But the important thing here is that it needs to be contained. It must be non-observable to, to the rest of the, of the world, you know, fully contained in this sort of safe haven, in this box, that where you only do your local computations. So you receive an event, you, you, sort of, you, you isolate your local computations within this service, and when you're done with your processing, then you sort of publish your facts to, to the outside world. And you do that by you are using immutable values, immutable facts. You, know, you publish these facts to the outside world for others to react on. And now they can do so through stable values. They know that whatever you published here is the truth. It can't be retracted. It can't just go away. It can't change when, it, when, when someone's looking at it, like you can, like, like, like you can you know, when you use mutable state in a concurrent system, for example. This can change while you look at it. You know, here it can actually work on, with stable values. So, but let's try to illustrate a little bit more what I mean, uh, how these sort of, how these event-driven services compose and interact with each other. Let's say that you have one user, it sends some sort of command, uh, starting in some sort of workflow or, or request chain. It wants, it wants the service to do something. It ends up in the service mailbox and triggers some sort of action. Then out of that, processing out of you know the act of doing something here an event is created and it's emitted out to an event stream okay this event stream 
relays this to whoever might be interested. It might be zero, it might be in this case two, two different services that, that are interested and subscribes to this, to this event. It ends up in their mailboxes or, or, or queues and triggers some sort of action. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't have to be services that, that you build. It can be, for example, databases. You might want to push events down into database to build some sort of materialized view on the data changes, for example. Or you might, or you, or you might want to emit that out to the outside world, for example, or to external systems for other other systems to act upon, etc. You have all these of all these possibilities. But, what, but what's really important here is in order to do this in a fully decoupled way, in a fully scalable and available way, you have to lean into and and embrace eventual consistency, which can be scary and tricky initially. But an events first design makes it quite straightforward and sometimes even easy to do so because it, it gives you the right tools for the job. So events can help us sort of craft these autonomous islands of non-determinism. I mean, you remember this wild ocean of non-determinism. How do you deal with that? You do that by, by creating these services that are deterministic within. And, but between, you still have this world of non-determinism. But, but you can always be sure that, that within your services, you can live happily sort of under the illusion that you know, things like time is absolute. There is one single now, one single present, even though that's not the case. You know, there's multiple you know, presents. You know, every, each, each, it's all in the eye of the beholder from the service perspective, in a, in a way. Uh, and, and you do this by, by sort of the, the, the source of truth, I would say. Uh, the way you model this is through the aggregate. If you use domain-driven design, you, you, then, you, then you probably know what the, what the aggregate is all, is all about through the entity or the, or the, sort of the, the, the group of entities, uh, usually sort of fronted by an aggregate root. Uh, so this, and this, it is this aggregate that maintains the integrity and consistency of the service. It is, it is our unit of consistency. Or it is also our unit of failure. You know, if, 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 if the aggregate fails, it needs to fail as a whole. Else you end up with, with partial failures. I have no idea what's going on. So, so it fails us as a whole. It re, it's restarted as a whole. It really is our unit of, of atomicity and our unit of determinism. And it's, it is really important that it's fully autonomous. I and mean, it is that through, as I, said, as I talked about, using uh, event-driven asynchronous communication. But one question then is, is, I mean, how do I coordinate state between these islands? You know, how can I ensure consistency and, and consensus? I think yes, it's really important to, 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 to sort of to have clear boundaries between, you know, where we can be certain about something and when we can be uncertain about something. And that's the boundary of the service. And, and one really nice framework for how to think about this, you know, in terms of state, and one's our mental model is, is, is one that I, I learned from, 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 from Pat Helen. And, and he talked about the, you know, inside data as our current present. That's our now. And that's our local state. We can always trust our local state. Now we have the outside data. That's sort of a blast from the past. That, that's our events that arrive into our system, our facts that we can choose to react on or not. And then we have between the services, we have what, 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 Pat, what, Pat, Helen, what Pat Helen calls hope for the future, almost poetic, right? And that's our commands, you know, that, that I, I, I send you uh, uh, a command hoping that you will receive it and you will act upon it, okay? So I, that's a, this is a model that sort of helped me think about the systems, uh, these systems in a good, in a better way. And and you know the event stream is really one of the key building blocks here because the way if, if we use the event stream like this, it, it is it can function as first the communication fabric. It can function as the integration fabric between you know subsystems or external systems or databases or anything like that. It, it can work as the replication fabric. You know, making sure that we can spin up multiple replicas and have them being in sync through the events that flow through the system. Okay. It can be our, our fabric of consensus as well, the way we make sense of, this, of, 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 of state between multiple services. 
And finally, it can be our persistence fabric, you know, because it's often better to think about persistence as a, as a function of the events rather than to trying to bring in yet another completely different model, like, like you know, mapping to tables or mapping to a relational model and things like that. And that's what I want to dive into now. So, you know, we have events first persistence. And, and what, what, what that means is that, uh, uh, sorry, first I just want to explain, you know, the, the problem with, with, with crowd services. People might ask, you know, okay, events are, it's nice, but why do I need to bring them all the way down to the persistence layer? What's wrong with CRUD? I'm used to, for you, for you that don't know what CRUD is, it's like it, it, it's, it's a short, uh, short time for create, read, update, delete, you know, simple relational database access and, 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 and use. So the question is, what's wrong with CRUD? I, first, I think that's really nothing wrong with CRUD per se. I mean, CRUD, CRUD works fine for totally isolated data. If you know that your service is not communicating with any other service, you never need to share this data. It's only for its own, it's, its own internal use. You know, this it, it's, it's really purely for this, for this, you know, local state that we talked about. The 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 this the sort of the the deterministic, strongly consistent local state. That is fine. The, the problem is that most services don't function like that. Most services, they communicate with other services to do things and, and delegate work to other services, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the problem is that cross crowd services, service consistency is really hard, you know? And the main reason for that is that it's, you can't do joins. Unless you bring in things like XA and distributed transactions, which is yet another completely different, you know, rat hole that we don't want to go into now. I think most people here, hopefully, most people here know the challenges of of of, of making di distributed transactions work. So let's not go go down this. <clears throat> it's also really hard to to reason about it. It gives us a more ad hoc and very weak guarantees, and you know. Often I end up with customers or, or, or users that feel like this, you know, reality continues to ruin, to ruin my life. You know, what you, the model that you have learned to love and works great with a monolith breaks down when it enters the world of distributed systems. And, you know, Pat Helen, uh, you know, once said that to face commit, you mean di di distributed transactions, uh, it's the same thing or it, it uses two-phase commit, is the anti-availability protocol. <clears throat> it's really the, uh, the, the, the perfect recipe to get poor, poor availability, poor scalability, bad performance, you know, a system where you can't reason about because you get, you get, you get part of failures, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And, and I believe that there's really nothing inherently wrong with strong consistency you know, that you get through transactions? Definitely not. It's a great tool when it has the right problem, uh, uh, when, when you apply it to the right problem. But the problem is a strong consistency, it's a really poor default. And most people, you know, they learn to love strong consistency because it makes the world easier, so they want to apply it everywhere. You know, and it, and it really works, it works very, very poorly, really, really badly in the world of distributed systems. So, so, so uh, the question is, what do we do? Yeah, it's no surprise, but we have to rely on eventual consistency as the default, and instead sort of opt in when we need strong consistency. And instead of doing the other way around, you know, often we see systems built with strong consistency as a default, and then they can, and then people try to loosen up the guarantees where they have bottlenecks. You know, it's better to do, do to do the other the other way around. To have a system that really scales by default, that is available and a way po possible to reason about as default, and then you opt in or on 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 strong consistency and transactions where you absolutely need to. And it's, and it's really uh, not that scary because it's really how the world works. The world is inherently eventually consistent. It's just that we programmers have spoiled ourselves by using strong consistency for so long that it feels like that's the reality. It's not. So how then, how do we transition off 
the crowd-based system and move towards an event-based system because a lot of people you know they don't have the chance of starting with a clean slate they have to they have to start with crowd and hopefully move towards a more available and scalable system uh, it is possible to still to still use crowd and combine it with the event stream that we, that we talked about i'll try to illustrate how here let's say we have two different services service a and service b they both use crowd uh, service A have table A and service B have, have has table B, okay. Uh, and, and let's say the service A want to update, you know, table A. Now, instead of just doing that, you know, and be done with it, what it does in, in this world of, of events is that it makes sure that it updates table A and pushes the event the, the event that represents that change into the event stream in an atomic fashion you know we and in aka for example have, have 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 great patterns and tools in order to make that happen but it's really a general pattern push it push and up to the, your table and push out an event representing that change in this in the sort of atomic transaction and, and then you do the same thing in service b let's now say we have service c that are interested in 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 both of the events coming or, or both of the changes to table A and table B. We know that we can't do a distributed transactions, it's just too costly, it doesn't give us availability and things like that. What we can do now, however, is have service C sort of subscribe to the events from uh, the update of service A and service B, and himself join those events in, in joining table A and table B, you know, providing the sort of materialized view in a way. And 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 uh, and then you know serve that to the outside world, uh, but that's very important that it that, that is done in a read-only fashion because you can't update this this table. This is a read-only table. But this is our way to move from CRUD into the world of distributed systems, uh, into the world of events, and and still reap a lot of the benefits of that, and still have a, a, a system that is loosely coupled. However, again. You're entering the world of eventual consistency, right? Ideally, you don't want to have these events, you know, the event stream flowing in a synchronous fashion, but an asynchronous fashion to maintain a loose, loose coupling. And uh, then you have to deal with eventual consistency, which is usually okay if you look at how the world works. You know, if you look at the business case you're actually trying to stall, it's usually okay. Sometimes it's not okay. Then you might have to, you know, go in, use a single database for all of these things. But often you don't have to. But we can do better, you know. Um, the main problem with CRUD is really updating place. It's destructive update. You know, Jim Gray once said that updating place strikes system designer as a cardinal sin. It violates traditional accounting practices that have been observed for hundreds of years. Yet again, I think we have a lot to learn from the real world and look at how the world have, deal, have dealt with these things for ages, you know through a, uh, sort of basic accounting principles. So you know, we can, so I think, I think we have a lot to learn here from traditional bookkeeping, you know, the proven practices that work, you know, in centuries, really old school tech, you know, uh, uh, with paper and pen. But it, this is the way that, that our society, you know, have made sense of data for ages. So, and, and we can apply this to, to our system uh, through the concept of event logging. And the event logging is, is, is where you store each event in order as they arrive, durable on disk, you know, just like a transaction log or just like transactions in, in an old school ledger, you know, like one item after another, building up to your history. Okay? And event logging, when used in this way, can really be the bedrock on which we can build you know, things like consistency, availability, scalability, traceability, and, and reach higher level of certainty. We actually know what's going on. We know which order the events are arriving, and we can even do things like replay the event log. I will talk about that later. So the event log is the bedrock. It's, it is our source of truth. Pat Helen again once said that the truth is the log. The database is the cache of a subset of the log. You know, you might ask, why are we using updating place? Why are we using these destructive updates? <clears throat> yeah, 
You know, I think, I think the main reason was the disk space used to be very, very expensive. You had to use, you had to preserve disk space. Just to be in, because your 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 else you have to like scale up uh, your system with 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 disk space to the to to the point where it wasn't profitable anymore. But you know, but today disk space is really really cheap. <clears throat> Still, we're using the old habits. You know? So there's really no reason to not store all history that's ever happened forever. It's actually quite viable. We have, I mean, I know a lot of companies that, that does that. The question is though, why work with the cache of a subset of the real thing when we can work with the real thing? You know, all, all SQL databases use transaction logging under the hood. It's just not exposed to us as users. We instead use this, have to use these, these these sort of snapshots, these tables that just provide a snapshot view of how the world looks right now. And whenever things change, we have to override our old history, you know. Event sourcing is a great pattern on top of the event log that gives us a way out of this problem. It is really a cure for the cardinal sin where we don't have to use updating plates. And event sourcing is where you log each state change event to a component in order, in the order as they arrive. And you know, the good thing is if you have designed your system around event, uh, with events first, you know, where your business logic is driven through events, you already have the events flowing in the system. The only thing you need to do is capture them and log them on disk, and you're essentially done. And, 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 and you do that sort of by sort of backing up the aggregates. So you, uh, so, you, so each aggregate is backed by a transaction log, or so an event log of, of everything that has ever entered into that aggregate in terms of state changing events. So you have strong consistency here, fully strong consistency within the aggregate, again, backed by the event log. But you still have the goodness of eventual consistency, the loose coupling, the availability uh, between the aggregates or the, or the services. Okay, so, but how does event sourcing work then? I'll try to illustrate it here. Let's say you have a user here, he sends a command to some sort of service or a, yeah, backed by an aggregate, and it ends up in his, in his mailbox or his, his message queue. It, it, it triggers some, some, sort, some sort of action. Out of that, we create an event. We've already talked about this, but instead of just pushing it down to the event stream, like we, like we talked about earlier, we log it to an event log in the order they are created, okay? Then we push it out to the event screen for others to consume. Okay, this is the happy path. This is, this is, this is you know, when everything is going well, okay? And this is also what, what some people call the pattern memory image. Martin Fowler has a write up of, of, the, of, of this pattern. It gives us a lot of benefits, you know, because you, all, all your state is, is functioning in memory. You never have to go down to the database to do a read. You know, if, if, you, if, if it's fine to just work with your local state, with your state within your components. It's all in memory, but it's backed by a durable event log. So it's fully durable, okay? That's why it's called a memory image, sort of an image, but of, 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 of your state is durable in memory. Okay. But what happens then if things go, go south, if, if that, if that uh, service is crashing for some for some reason. Yeah, the sad path and, and how we then recover from failure is very straightforward. The only thing we need to do is to take the event log and replay the events one by one, you know, as they enter the service in the first place and bring the component up to state, up to speed, you know, up to where it was when it, when it crashed. And some people ask, okay, but what if I, this system's been going on for 10 years and I can't replay every, every single event, it will take forever. Sure, for practical reasons, you know, event sourcing has the notion of, of snapshotting. So, so and, and, and in ACA persistence, for example, and no, most event sourcing libraries, you have, you have the option of doing snapshotting, which means that you take the snapshot of, the, of your component as it is now in time, you know, and then you store that into the database or into the event log. 
So what you do then is then on a failure, you sort of just search for the first snapshot back in time, back, you, you, you search the event log in, 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 in reverse. You reinstantiate the snapshot and then you replay the event log from there. The snapshot can be done, you know, every n, n number of events, every 1,000 events, or every 10 minutes or every hour or something like that. So that's a, that's a practical way of doing it. But then the very cool thing is that you don't only have to replay the event log on failure, you can also do it you know, on, on replication, for example, or having hot uh, replicas, you know, that, 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 that sort of, uh, uh, and, and you can do it, for example, for audit reasons, for example, you might not want, want to know what, what went wrong or why a big component behaved in a certain way or, or, or look why a user enacted in a specific way. You can just replay the, the event log offline, so to speak, because you can have, you, you can have, you know, sort of an offline, world or an offline uh, uh, sort of environment only subscribe on the subscribe you know in an asynchronous fashion on the events that that happen in in the live system so, so you have sort of a mirror world where you can then choose to 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 slow down uh, uh, the execution and slowly replay the events uh, from the fail component for example understanding what went wrong try to understand what went wrong or for all the reasons, for anything like that, uh, which is really cool. So, so to recap, you know, event sourcing gives us sort of an event way, event first way of, of, of building a source of truth with all history that has ever happened in the system. No destructive updates. You have full out, full understanding what what has happened since since day one. It allows for this memory image, you know, durable in memory state. And then one of the nice things with, with that is that it avoids this infamous object relational impedance mismatch. It's really hard to map objects and, or, 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 or functional state, records or whatever, you know, to a, a relational model. That creates this impedance mismatch, you know, and, you know, and, and, and uh, that we see, you know, using Hibernate and, and, and over JPA or things like that. You can just avoid all that. Work with your in-memory state in the best representation for, for, for the way you work with, with, with your state in memory, in your components, while still have it fully, fully durable. And it also has, 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 has a way like, without any real cost, have others subscribe to the state changes because they simply subscribe to the changes of the event log as it happens. And it also tends to have really good Mechanical sympathy. Mechanical sympathy is sort of a term that Martin Thompson coined as essentially a way, you know, a, a way to describe a system that is is in line with how the hardware works, instead of fighting how hardware works. You know, it's in line with 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 uh, you know the constraints and the optimizations that you can do with with modern hardware. Like for example, in, in the event sourcing case, it is it, it utilizes the single right principle, avoiding all contention. And just write fully uncontended straight down to this, especially using things like SSD. Uh, 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 it's, it's really, really fast. Uh, so uh, that's for the right side. But with one, with one sort of uh, quick question, you know, that you might have and that, that I get a lot, of course, all that sounds great, you know, but what about queries? How do I manage queries? Yeah, uh, one really nice pattern uh, that usually goes hand in hand with event sourcing is a pattern called CQRS. You know, it stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and it's and it was recorded by Greg by Greg Young, uh, sort of one one of the most prominent uh, architects in the domain driven design community, and it, and it's really sort of based based on the, uh, on the pattern that we talked about, the event log pattern. But, and it, but you can use it, you know, equally good for, 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 for pure CRUD, by the way. But I will now talk about it from the lens of event logging because that's what we have. You know, but the essence of, 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 of CQR is, is that it, it gives you a way to separate writes from reads. It's completely separate the write model from the read model. You know, the read and the write model 
if, you, if, if, if we take a step back and look at it from a more abstract way, you know, the read and the write model usually have very different characteristics in terms of consistency requirements, in terms of scalability, in terms of availability, and things like that. You know, in, 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 it might mean that, you know, for, for, for a write heavy system, for example, you might want to scale up the, the write side a lot more than, than, than the read side. Or vice versa, but by coupling them together, like most databases do, you, you don't have the option of, of, of scaling them in the, independently of each other. But but probably the, the most important thing is that it allows both of these sites, the right side and the read side, to be stored and to be used in the most optimal format for uh, for its purpose. I, I truly believe that in event in an event-driven system, the event log is the ultimate way of storing. Uh, the state, you know, just store it in the order it arrives and you're done. Okay. The read side, however, you know, it's, like it's, very, it's often very hard to query the event log, but the read side then can be in any kind of model. It can be that the, the ultimate model for your use case for the read side is in it is a relational database, for example. It might be that it's, a, it's some sort of column based database like Cassandra or something like that. It might be a, a, a graph database like Neo for J. Or it might be that it's best to just shove it down into HDFS, for example, and use you know, Hadoop or, or something like that for doing you know, batch processing overnight to get insight into your query model. And, or it might be you know, any, any combination of that. You might want to store things down into a relation database for, for, for back office, but you want to also store it in some sort of, some, some, in some sort of graph database for, to, to do, uh, uh, you know, yeah, some, some some sort of social social media type of of, 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 of graph understanding of, of, of connections and things like that. You know, you have all all kinds of options. Uh, so I'll try to illustrate the, through some graphics here uh, a simple use case of how this how, how did this could work. Let's say you have a user here and he sends a command to our service and the cert or and and the service now then serves and this service or serves their the right side. And it does that, you know, by just storing the events in the order arrived down into the event log. Here now we can we can we can we talked about this, but let's repeat ourselves here just because it's important. You know, this event log that can then send that push the events out to the event stream for others to consume. Now that consuming side, the receiving side, you know, can be the read side model. That's sort of pushes down the, 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 the events down into some sort of optimal storage for the read side. Can be said, as I said before, it can be a relation database, can be a NoSQL database or something like that. And that read side is now so serving the read side model that, that, that the user can query whenever he wants to do, to, to do so. The benefit here is that this decoupling gives us a more knobs to, to turn when it comes to scale and availability. And it also gives us, <clears throat> You know, a way of storing each model in the most, in, in the best format for this use case. And that might vary, you know, depending on different use cases. You might, you might not have one way of doing it across your whole system. Yet again, <clears throat> the important, one important thing is that here we also sort of get into the territory of eventual consistency. Be, 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 because between the right, the right side model and the right side model, there is usually some sort of latency. In, in a practical system, it's usually down to milliseconds. But, but uh, still, there is, is, there is, it's, it's, it is important to understand that eventual consistency is at play here. And I have to say, you know, if that is a non-option, what, what you can do, even though I would say again, this is not the default, but you have the option of actually having one single, for example, SQL database here that, pr that can provide atomicity that is serving both, the, uh, uh, both models. So you have, you have, you have one, it's actually, it, it, that's where you store your event log and you can, in the same transaction, then also update your tables for read side storage. And then eventual consistency goes out the window. Right, but this of course has, has might have some some effect on availability and scalability and performance. So 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 again, choose what patterns work best for the use case that you need, and don't add any more guarantees than you absolutely need. Right, because guarantees, even though they're nice, they add costs. Okay. 
So that's essentially all I had. I just want to recap the key, the key takeaways that I want you to take away from this talk is that event, events first design helps you to first reduce risk when modernizing applications, I believe, through that, through experience that it does. It helps us to move faster and more predictably, I believe, towards a resilient and scalable architecture. It gives you sort of nudges you into the right patterns and the right ways of thinking, how to model you know, the world in asynchronicity I mean, through, through the, sort of the, the flow of, of, of data across uh, uh, different services, sometimes across a network. And that puts us on a path to designing autonomous services. And autonomy is one of the most important things in a distributed system and when, when building microservices. So it's a really nice way, I believe, to balance certainty you know, between the services to the, um, sorry, the sorry, certainty within each service to the uncertainty between the services. Because as, as Oliver said in the beginning of this, of this, of this session, you know, one microservice is, is not of much use. They always come in systems. It's how they collaborate and work together to solve problems. That's really interesting. That's where the magic happens. And event logging, I believe, allows you to, to do things like avoid CRUD and, and avoid ORAM, this relational, uh, uh, object relational impedance mismatch, the mapping that you always had to do, you know, using CRUD and those were using, you know, um, hard, hard, things like Hibernate and JPA, et cetera. JDO, if you, if you remember that. And it allows you to take control of your system's history. You know, history, the history matters. And why, cons why consistently use disruptive optics to erase your history and then having to probably you know, log it somewhere else, you know, instead of just, you know, lean into event logging and it's all there, right, where you, where you, where you, where you need it. It also allows you things like, you do things like, like, like time travel, replay the event log for audit reasons, for, 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 you know, re, to do, to, uh, to do replication, for example, for debuggability, understanding what's going on in the system and things like that. And it gives us a, a nice way of balancing strong consistency within each service, backed by the event log, and eventual consistency between. It gives us more knobs to turn, more headroom in terms of scale and, and, and availability. And <clears throat> you know, I, you know, I'm, everyone knows that, that I'm biased, right? But but I really believe that ACA can can do a lot of this heavy, of this heavy lifting. It has really it has support for everything that we discussed so far. It's really a perfect model to build autonomous, resilient, and event-driven microservices. Uh, you know, you know, through through you know, this full this reactive, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer service mesh, essentially that, that that you get with this actor model. You know, it's fully cloud-native even before the, the you know the, the term was coined, and fully reactive, meaning elastic, resilient, and and responsive. And it, it, it has a lot of tools, you know, that makes the, these things easy. It has, you know, first class support for things like point to point, for pub sub, for streaming. And it has, you know, when it comes to communication protocols, it supports HTTP, 101 and 200, TCP, you know, Aaron, Kafka, it supports reactive streams, gRPC, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, it has first-class support for event-based persistence, like I just talked about, through the module called ACA Persistence. It gives you event sourcing, gives you a way of doing CPRS through materialized views and all of these things. That's actually quite tricky things to do yourself. So you should definitely use a library. If, if, if it's not ACA, it should be something else. But uh, ACA is a great start, I believe. And it's really made for mortals has a really good track record of helping customer, of helping users and say, uh, doing this and, and nudging them in the right direction. You, you can get it at akka.io. And if you want to learn more, I wrote a, a little mini book. It's freely available on, on you can just download it here at the, the Bitly link. Uh, it's really sort of about building reactive microsystems. That's essentially, you know, uh, uh, the essence of building uh, events first. Uh, microservices, like the topic of this talk. So that's all I had. Uh, thanks for your attention. I hope I hope I didn't bore you out, and I hope I made sense along the way. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jonas. I have to say, the 
uh, attendance rate continued to be around 95% the whole time. Um, we did go a little bit longer than usual and I want to respect your time. So there was a lot of questions. I, I did my best to pick some that are that had kind of common themes and I'm kind of meshing them into, um, into kind of a, a meta question. Um, one of the first, one of the more common questions uh, out there are um, accommodating failure in, a, in an event stream. Um, so what happens when something fails during an event stream? Um, what, how is data lost during transmissions of an event or while writing to the event log handled? Yeah, uh, I, I think this, the, 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 I think that this is, you know, in the case of failure is really one of the places where event, where uh, event sourcing and event first design really shines because uh, what you can do is you can simply, you know, pick up where, where where the from where the last successful you know uh, point in state or in or in event happened and simply replay uh, the events in, in you know uh, that 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 uh, happened during the failure or during the outage and and since everything is event log on disk you can do that even though the whole node crashes you can even do that by so if the node crash you can even you know, so reinstantiate the service on another machine and replay him there, and and uh, and you know when it comes to reliability of the transmission of events, which which I also hinted in that question, uh, uh, is is uh, you know Aka has support for at least once delivery that essentially gives you the building block to 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 build like once and once on the delivery. Uh, essentially, it so solves you know for you all the hard things like deduplication, retransmission of events, and these things. So, so essentially, if if we talk about you know Scala code, you would you would simply just you know add a trait called uh, you know at least once deliver it, and it has all those things for you taken care of. With this Java, you just just inherit an abstract class in your in your service that manages all of those things when it comes to the retransmission of events for you. So, you, so it depends on where things fail and what kind of le le level of guarantee you, you have, if it's lost messages or if, if the whole service or node crashed. But, but ACA should have you covered. And more importantly, this type of architecture should have you covered. Okay, I think that, that answers that question. Um, Regarding event sourcing, there's a uh, member of the audience uh, saying, you know, is this still is this recommended when you have limited uh, disk space, for example? Um, and you know, if you're running into, you know, literally running out of space, um, how would you handle the ever-growing event log and uh, do it that way? Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, sure. Um, I I still think that that you. You can use event logging, but perhaps not preserve all history. I mean, the, the one so the I think the best way of doing that is, is simply to 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 do some you do some sort of compactation where you where sort of you, it's essentially you you merge all events into into a, a snapshot and 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 only preserve. Uh, you know, an hour of events or a day of events or whatever you want to sort of discard all events, you know, up to the latest snapshot, essentially. So, so whenever, you know, a failure happens, you, you simply instantiate that snapshot to replay the events from the latest hour or the latest day. What you lose, however, is, of course, the ability to, to understand, you know, the history uh, throughout the system and, 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 and things like auditing and, and, and stuff like that. But, but you can absolutely still use event logging discard how much you have to discard you know making sure that you have a snapshot to 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 start with when you do the when you do the the replay mm -hmm. okay uh the final question we have time for today is about the saga pattern i have actually seen you speak about the saga pattern several times mm -hmm. and uh, the question from the uh, member of the audience today is in terms of maintaining state in an event driven system is the saga pattern uh, something that you recommend or have have experimented with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, saga patterns is one of the one of the better patterns, I think, uh, or, or more useful patterns, I'll say, rather than better patterns, uh, when it comes to 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 making sense of, of 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 workflow. You know, I'd say, I mean, it's 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 a it's a great pattern to manage workflow in a 
in a in a in a sort of fault tolerant way. It's really a pattern for fault tolerance and you know, for resilience, in which you I don't know if most people most people perhaps don't know what, but I can try to read and sort of just to summarize what the saga what the saga pattern is. It's essentially a way of for each operation you have you have a you define uh, sort of, um, in your workflow you have you have an undoing sort of compensating action that does the reverse so 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 and you have some sort of orchestrator of the saga or or it can be done only through 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 uh, actually by, by by passing the state of, of the saga across the events uh, between between the services as well but but essentially what what you, what you have that's some sort of way of coordinating that if if a failure happens uh, uh, sort of you know let's say the service a calls service b that calls service c if curve is if, if, if service c fails you have a way of, of undoing by by call by invoking the compensating action on service C, notifying service C to trigger its compensating action to reverse whatever happened, and 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 the same thing with with service A. So you have a way of sort of undoing that that whole workflow and restart it over if needed. Uh, so it's a really it's a really nice way of getting resilience and sort of fault tolerance into your workflow. But still having it in a fully event-based and asynchronous fashion. You know, most transactions do this, of course. That's what they do. But they do that in a blocking, uh, stop the world, you know, type of, of, of synchronous fashion. So the saga pattern fits very well because it, it, it works at, 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 at just as well in a fully asynchronous fashion. So I've seen really a lot of a lot of good use coming out of that. That, that, that's also something I cover in, in a little bit more depth in this mini book, uh, uh, Reactive Microsystems, if you want to learn more. All right. Well, Jonas, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always an excellent experience to, uh, to see one of your talks. And I, I'm looking forward to taking some of your uh, excellent images uh, and hopefully turning them into some GIFs, maybe, mm -hmm. or GIFs, if you prefer that. <laughs> thank you all, Oliver. Yeah, thanks. So thanks to our audience for joining us today. I hope you found it useful. Get Jonas's book. Uh, a lot of what he spoke about today is in there. I put the link into the uh, GoToWebinar chat for anyone who wants to download it now. So we'll say goodbye and thanks to everyone for coming uh, to join us today.